That morning, a cold northern wind blew, piercing to the bone. It raced wildly through the dense forests, creating a howl among the mighty trunks of firs and pines, lifting whirls of snow, scattering it around like a dancer spinning in an endless dance. The wind caught at the clothes of the few passers-by, raised snow curtains in front of their faces, and tried to knock them off their feet, insistently proving its superiority. It pushed forward, struck sideways, and when people disappeared behind the walls of houses or took shelter inside, the wind began to play with signs and lift snow whirls in the middle of the streets. But despite nature's whims, the residents of the small Alaskan town did not deviate from their daily affairs. They were accustomed to such weather and were not afraid of even the most severe blizzards. The main thing was that the snowstorms did not bury the roads and wild animals did not come too close to their homes. Everything else could be endured. By noon, the sky was covered with heavy leaden clouds, which began to ominously darken on the horizon. And in the distance, the first muffled peals of thunder were heard, heralding the approaching storm. The weather was getting worse by the hour, and more and more doors were locked. The streets of the town soon emptied, and only one girl, sent by her mother to the outskirts to her father, made her way through the blizzard to the path leading to the forest. Her dark hair, fluttering in the wind, resembled dark streams, and the hood of her blue-down jacket was constantly blown off her head by a powerful gust of wind. But the girl no longer tried to fix it. Lowering her head, she hurried to deliver a warm lunch to her father. Emily, that was the young lady's name. Contrary to her mother's insistence, decided to take a shortcut and, having climbed the hill, set off running through the snow-covered grove, hoping to also take shelter from the wind behind the mighty trunks. She only failed to consider that the fluttering down jacket behind her would catch on branches, further hindering her movement. After another attempt to free herself, Emily frowned, deciding whether to continue through the forest and risk tearing the jacket, or to return to the path and take the long but safe way. Time was passing, and she feared she would not make it back home before dark. Meeting Jake, the local boy she so wanted to see, now seemed to her more important than anything. Deciding not to waste a minute, Emily moved on, tightly holding a basket with lunch for her father in one hand and trying to keep the down jacket in place with the other. With a new gust of wind, barely missing knocking fragile Emily off her feet, the crackle of branches reached her ears. There was clearly someone else in the grove. Stopping, the girl began to look around, but through the dense snow curtains, it was hard to see anything. Holding her breath for a few moments, Emily tried to listen again and again, but silence reigned around, broken only by the rustling of snow. Just as the girl took a step, the mysterious crackle repeated, freezing her in place, but this time it also made her tense up. A lump slowly formed in her chest, her pulse quickened, and Emily, looking around again, hastened her steps, wanting to leave this suddenly extremely gloomy place as soon as possible. With each new step, the rustle and crunch of branches breaking under someone's weight grew louder. It seemed as though the girl was not running away from the source of the sound but heading straight towards it, although Emily was sure that whoever else was in the grove was somewhere behind her. Besides the chilling fear, she suddenly felt someone's intense gaze fixed on her back. Without looking back, the girl ran, dropping the basket along the way, which fell to the ground with a dull thud. The fluttering hood of the down jacket kept catching on trees, forcing Emily to stop again and again, with trembling hands to tear the fabric and listen as someone made their way through the grove right behind her. With each second, the pursuer got closer, doing so with incredible speed. 
Heavy steps, either of a human or rather an animal, were drawing nearer. A scream of desperation escaped the girl's throat. Though in such a wilderness and with such weather, when the whistle of the wind drowns out other sounds, no one could hear her. Pleas for help were drowned in the monstrous roar produced by that unseen creature that was so eager to catch up with Emily. The edge of the down jacket caught so firmly on a branch that the girl fell to the ground, momentarily disoriented. That moment was enough for the pursuer to get so close that Emily could see it. Never before had she seen such creatures. Huge, the size of a bear, with a wolfish muzzle, pointed ears, and large fangs protruding from its mouth. The animal's fur was silver gray, with an unusual red stripe running along its spine. A low, throaty growl escaped the creature's partly open mouth, and that was the last sound, mixed with her own scream, that Emily heard. News of the young girl gone missing spread through the small town in the blink of an eye. Despite the foul weather and approaching darkness, many residents took to the streets with flashlights and rifles, ready to search for the missing Emily. The girl's father, having waited several hours on the outskirts for his daughter, decided she had simply forgotten about lunch or had run off without asking to hang out with her friend again. And so the father, leaving his work, headed home. He was very displeased with his restless and whimsical daughter, and had she appeared before him at that moment, the man would have, without hesitation, had a serious talk. But at home, he was met only by his puzzled wife, who was also nervous, waiting for the daughter who should have already returned. Emily's father, Mr. Russell, immediately set out to find Jake, his daughter's friend, after talking to his wife. However, the young man could only shrug, not knowing where the girl could have gone. Soon, the news that one of the town's residents had disappeared spread throughout the community. 200 volunteers gathered in the main square. Dividing into groups, they began to check every street, house, and then the outskirts, fields, and forested areas surrounding the town. By midnight, the mutilated body of Emily Russell was found in the forest beyond the hill. The girl could only be identified by her clothes and the jacket torn to shreds. Her face was marred with deep wounds, as was almost her entire body, as if some wild beast had torn her skin with its claws. The dry leaves beneath her body had turned an unpleasant shade of crimson, and on the blood-soaked ground there was a large print belonging either to a bear, which was occasionally seen in the area, or to an unusually large wolf. Most people leaned towards the latter option, as wolf howls often echoed over the town, yet the predators had never attacked humans before, neither at night nor, especially, during such gloomy weather. The following day, all the townsfolk gathered in the local church, an event that had become unusual of late. Due to the unknown assailant and reason behind poor Emily's attack, panic began to set in among the people. To calm the public, Priest Richard proposed a curfew, but the majority of the residents, especially the men, rejected the idea. Mr. Russell, deeply grieving his daughter's death, declared he would find the beast that killed his girl, and many, including his wife and Jake, supported him in this resolve. On the day of Emily's funeral, rain fell. With a dull thump, large drops hit the wooden lid of the closed coffin, blending with the tears in the eyes of the girl's relatives, and ticking away the seconds until the hunt that was decided to commence at dawn. Priest Richard, holding a Bible in his hands, softly expressed condolences for the loss of such a wonderful and young girl as Emily Russell then read a prayer for the repose of her soul. It took several minutes to lower the coffin into the grave and cover it with earth, after which the townspeople dispersed to their homes, leaving the deceased's relatives in mourning. Come on, Jake, Mrs. Lorak urged,
pulling at the sleeve of her reluctant son. Casting one last look over his shoulder at the grave and the hunched figures of Mr. and Mrs. Russell, the boy somberly followed Mrs. Lorak. Inside him raged a turmoil of emotions tearing him apart. Grief and longing for his deceased friend, anger at the wild beast that killed her, and a burning despair over his own helplessness. After all, he was only 17, and no one would allow him to join the hunt. Mr. Russell, upon hearing the boy's wish to join the search party, put a hand on his shoulder, sighed bitterly, and shook his head, saying he wouldn't allow anything similar to happen to him. Jake tried to argue, but then his father intervened with a tone that brooked no objection, declaring that his son would stay home. It was pointless to start a new argument after the funeral, and the young man retreated to his room, spending the entire evening there. By the time the rain had stopped and the last rays of sun appeared on the horizon, lanterns were lit on the streets of the town. Cracking open the window, Jake heard adults' conversations from the nearby bar about the upcoming hunt, weapons, and strategy. One suggested setting traps around the town. Another was eager to track the monster by its trail. Jake himself would have, without hesitation, taken his father's rifle and roamed through the forests and surroundings until he found the beast to put an end to it with a few shots to the chest. As night fell, a tired father returned home. He talked at length with Mrs. Lorak, but try as Jake might to eavesdrop, he could make out nothing. Giving up on trying to learn the content of their conversation, he went to bed, but sleep eluded him. Only at dawn did he feel his eyelids become heavy, but he resisted sleep, hoping his father would change his mind and take him on the hunt. However, after a quick bite and grabbing the rifle, the father, with one look, showed that his decision was final. Jake was left at home. The rain continued to drum on the roofs, tap on the windows, soaking through anyone daring enough to step outside. The hunters had long since left the town, vanishing into the surroundings, while Jake aimlessly wandered around the house, struggling with anxiety for his father and the desire to follow everyone into the forest. He knew where his father kept another rifle, an old one with an occasionally jammed trigger, but still serviceable. Waiting until his mother went to the living room, Jake quietly snuck to the kitchen, moved the table, and began to feel around the floorboards. One of them gave way under pressure, and prying it open with his fingers, the young man uncovered the hiding place with the rifle. The temptation to take the weapon was too great, and there he was, clutching the rifle to himself, throwing on a cloak, and slipping out of the house, not forgetting to close the hiding spot. His heart was pounding wildly, and his arms and legs moved automatically as he feverishly planned his next steps. A white mist of fog slowly spread through the town streets, giving the area a gloomy appearance. The sky remained clouded without a single break, and in the distance, crows cawed loudly, a sign the local residents always considered an ill omen. Lately, these black birds had become increasingly noisy. Disregarding superstitions, Jake headed towards the hill where Emily's body was found. It seemed to him that the search should start right from there. Just a few feet away from the needed path, Jake spotted a person running towards him. It was his longtime friend Tyler Morgan, a thin young man with long, shoulder-length blonde hair and a face dotted with freckles. Tyler seemed even paler than usual, but the sight of Jake with his father's shotgun didn't seem to scare him. Something serious had happened since he didn't even ask where his friend was headed. Over there, there, Hurry! Tyler barely managed to articulate, gasping for breath. Water ran down his hair onto his face, but the young man paid no heed. He was so agitated that Jake, without a moment's hesitation, followed him to the other end of the town. 
Their path took them through a tiny forest and prickly bushes, leading directly to a clearing. Jake got momentarily entangled in the thicket, while his friend skillfully navigated through the brush. Emerging at the edge of the clearing, he saw Rachel, Tyler's sister, who always walked with her beloved dogs in the distance. The girl, noticing the boys, beckoned them over. And as Jake and Tyler approached, he saw that Rachel's eyes were red from crying and she trembled like an autumn leaf. Without a word, the girl pointed behind a large boulder and Jake, noticing his friend had frozen in place, cautiously circled the rock. What he saw made him jump back in fright. It was hard to tell how many dogs had been with her. Now, only scattered pieces of flesh, fur, and pools of blood remained of the animals. Something very strong had torn them apart, partially gnawing the meat to the bones, then scattering its unfinished meal across the grass. In several places, Jake noticed small indentations in the ground where there was almost no grass, but he dared not get closer. The place now looked too ghastly. We need to leave, Rachel whispered, clutching her brother's hand. What if whatever did this decides to come back? Go, Jake nodded in agreement, although he was sure the beast wouldn't appear. After all, Rachel had been here alone, albeit for only a few minutes while Tyler was looking for someone to call over and the creature hadn't shown up. It meant it had finished its business and left, leaving behind this bloody mess. And you? What are you planning? His friend asked, noticing how, with a firmer grip on the shotgun, he circled the stone and moved toward the forest where the beast might have gone. No need for hunters there. If the animal went in that direction, it'll soon run into one of them. Then, we need to warn them. Jake found the most compelling reason not to return to the town. Adrenaline surged through his veins, and he firmly decided it was time to act. Leaving his fears behind, Jake confidently stepped into the forest, shotgun at the ready. Danger came from an unexpected direction. Jake flinched at Rachel's terrified scream, echoing loudly over the clearing. Turning around, he saw the girl running away from the boulder, trying to manage her cumbersome clothing. Another scream, this time from Tyler trying to warn his sister. Before Jake could understand what was happening, a large dark figure leaped out from behind the stone slab. The beast was huge. It caught up with Rachel in a couple of bounds, knocking her to the ground with a powerful swipe of its paw. Tyler followed, clutching his stomach. From under his fingers, blood flowed. Acting on instinct, Jake cocked the trigger on the run and fired at the creature. So agitated, he hardly aimed. His hands trembled with the panic that suddenly seized him. It all seemed much simpler in his mind. At that moment, the beast abruptly stopped and, instead of attacking the unfortunate girl, skillfully dodged. The bullet whizzed past, barely missing the animal's left ear. The monster lifted its blood-streaked muzzle, bearing long and sharp dagger-like teeth, and slowly turned its entire body, moving as gracefully as a house cat. The ensuing ferocious growl drowned out the quiet click of Jake's jammed rifle. The young man stared wide-eyed at the beast approaching him. There was no point in running. Suddenly, the clearing was deafened by several gunshots. Hunters nearby had heard the screams. The creature pushed off the ground with its powerful paws, leaping right over Jake, who had fallen to the ground, grazing him with a sharp claw. In a few great bounds, the wolf reached the forest and disappeared from view behind the trees. The chasing hunters continued to shoot, while some rushed to help the boys. Rachel, unfortunately, was already dead and Tyler severely wounded. Jake sported a long scratch across his forehead, splitting his eyebrow. Tyler did not survive until the evening. His injury was so severe that no efforts could save the boy. The brother and sister were buried next to Emily Russell's grave. The hunters who had chased after the beast 
found nothing. The rain that began anew, turning into snow, covered all traces, and the disappointed men, leaving a few traps, returned back to the town. Mr. Lorax said not a word to his son. After the experienced horror, Jake did not close his eyes until morning, unable to shake off the chill even under two thick blankets. The last screams of Rachel, mingling with the growling of the beast that emerged out of nowhere, rang clearly in his ears. In one swipe, it had sliced open Tyler's abdomen, then pounced on his sister, depriving her of life within seconds. It seemed that Jake was not meant to survive that moment. After the funeral, where Reverend Richard called upon the residents not to venture beyond the town until the beast was captured, Meister Lorak took his son to work with him. People long argued whether the beast was a wolf or something else, but despite the threat, they were not going to stop their work. Warning their wives and children to stay inside, they went to the local mine, power plant, or sawmill. I won't ask where you got the rifle from and why you didn't listen to me, Mr. Lorak began with icy calm in his voice, making Jake tense in anticipation of despair. However, instead, his father declared he had bought a new rifle for his son, and that tomorrow they would check the traps and snares together. This beast won't kill anyone else. We'll take care of that. Jake nodded gratefully, though the thought of a possible encounter with the monster sent shivers down his spine again. The thirst for vengeance for his slain friends helped him keep his composure. The next morning, armed with the new rifle, he kissed his weeping mother on the cheek and stepped outside with his father. The streets slowly filled with the hollow echo of the footsteps of dozens of people. No one spoke a word, all limited themselves to brief nods. Jake shivered, adjusting the collar of his cloak. The weather continued to worsen. The stiff strap of the new rifle painfully dug into his shoulder, but the young man tried not to show his discomfort, fearing his father would think him not strong enough and send him back home. He confidently followed his father, flinching at loud sounds or the cawing of crows circling above their heads, always ready to grab the rifle at any moment. Nothing again, his father grimly noted after checking another trap. Must be. This monster lives further north. We'll head there tomorrow, might find tracks or something else. What about the beast simply avoiding the traps? Squinted Mr. Thomas Lawrence an elderly man with silver hair and a wrinkled face, as if each ray of light caused him pain. Don't make me laugh, Mr. Lorak retorted sharply. No animal can be smarter than a human. Lawrence shrugged indifferently, unwilling to argue, and the group continued on their way. In the evening, after checking all the traps, which remained untouched, the team returned home without results. Exhausted Jake, tired from sleepless nights, fell asleep as soon as he got into bed. The following days of almost continuous hunting yielded no results. Some began to say that perhaps one of the hunters had indeed hit the animal that night, and it died from its wounds, although its body was never found. Several hunters put away their weapons, deciding that continuing the search was pointless, and returned to their usual activities. Nevertheless, Mr. Lorak and a few other hunters continued their daily forays into the forest for a week. The determination to find the beast did not leave them, although even Jake began to doubt the purpose of the search. Life in the town slowly returned to normal, and people began to forget the fear that had gripped them. But just as people began to breathe freely, the beast made itself known again. This time, the wolf attacked right near the church, located on the outskirts of the town, which especially alarmed the residents, considering the proximity to their homes. Priest Richard barely survived, thanks to a miracle, later telling everyone that the wolf had approached him unnoticed and almost caused his death. The shock of the experience made his stories confusing. 
The man got off with a superficial wound and became even more zealous in calling for vigilance among the residents. Running around the forest with rifles is useless, Meister Russell pondered later, for whom the hunt for the wolf had become a life mission after the loss of his daughter. He suggested setting up an ambush, luring the beast into an open space, and then opening fire on it with all available weapons. This idea was approved by most, including Jake and his father. At dawn, in the field where Rachel and Tyler had died, several cows were driven out. To the hunter's surprise, the animals behaved extremely restlessly, despite the men's efforts to direct them towards the forest. The hunter's attention was focused on the cattle, and they didn't notice the beast watching them from behind the trees. Just a moment before the attack, Jake noticed movement and barely had time to think when the wolf already lunged at the people. Shots were fired one after another, but Jake only heard his father's voice, screaming for him to run. Mr. Lorak, aiming, rushed towards the beast, which had managed to deliver fatal blows to one of the hunters. The next shot made the wolf retreat, but the animal continued to attack until it received a serious injury and decided to retreat into the forest. Hit, Jake whispered when he realized what had happened. His father had managed to wound the beast, and quite severely, as the creature chose to immediately flee. They could have chased it down and finished off the monster, but Jake was more concerned about his father, who lay motionless on the ground. Standing up, the young man ran to the man and then saw the terrible torn wound on his chest. It seemed the beast had also managed to wound the hunter. The score was even. Help! He's wounded, Jake cried, falling to his knees next to his dying father. Two men, one of them a local doctor, hurried over, but it was already too late. Mr. Lorak passed away. The loss of his father deeply shook Jake. He realized that he now simply had to find the beast and shoot it between the eyes, avenging all those who had been killed. He could not allow this animal to feel its power over the town and instill fear in the residents. He could not let it continue its dreadful deeds, mocking the most skilled hunters who were powerless before it. Jake could not permit this beast to roam the surroundings any longer, terrorizing the people, disrupting their peaceful sleep at night and their routine work. The wolf had to be caught and killed as soon as possible. Filled with determination, that evening Jake forcefully opened the door of the local bar where the hunters gathered. The door banged against the wall with a crash, drawing the attention of everyone present. Looks full of sympathy and curiosity focused on the young man. Jake walked to the center of the hall, stopping in front of Jack Brown, a robust man in his prime, a renowned hunter who had left his comrades to die on the battlefield today. This isn't just an animal, it's the devil himself come to destroy our town, Jack growled, meeting Jake's challenge in his eyes. I grieve for your father, boy, but you're not the only one who lost someone today. You're a coward, Jake exclaimed, clenching his fists so tightly his knuckles whitened. My father died fighting the monster that has already killed several innocent people. Other hunters also laid down their lives there, on the battlefield, while you cowardly hid your asses here. How dare you call yourself a hunter after that? And you? All of you? Jake angrily asked. He scanned all those sitting in the pub, and no one dared to meet his gaze. Many hunched over their mugs, some exchanged glances, and some, like Mr. Brown, tilted their heads back and stared at the ceiling, grinding their teeth. You better leave, kid. One of the local drunks, sitting in the far corner of the room, piped up. Jake didn't remember his name and paid no attention to the comment at all. He hadn't come here to argue or get into a fight. He had something to say. Tomorrow I'm going back into the forest, and I won't return to the village until I find the wolf, Jake declared loudly. Alone or with some of you, it doesn't matter. 
but I will not let this beast continue to kill my loved ones and friends. And you, if you're so scared, can lock yourselves at home and wait until I bring the monster's head to your feet. Without waiting for a response, Jake quickly left the pub, heading home. In some ways, he was overly confident, naively believing that without significant hunting experience, he could still track down the wolf, and he knew it well. But the tears of his mother, mourning her dead husband, sitting in the kitchen and hiding her face in his cloak, the dim look of Mr. Russell, who had been visiting the pub more frequently with each passing day and leaving it intoxicated, and memories of Emily, Tyler, and Rachel, with whom he had interacted since childhood, did not allow him to back down. Jake mentally swore to himself to seek vengeance, whatever the cost. A cloud of breath escaped the young man's mouth. The weather this morning was even worse than in recent days. It seemed that frosts were very close, which was somewhat advantageous for the hunters. Perhaps the harsh climate of Alaska would force the beast to leave. Moving further into the forest, no longer surprised by the sight of another untouched trap, Jake felt his back ache from the long walk and constant tension, but did not allow himself to stop for a minute. Mr. Thomas, who had once spoken to Jake's father about the wolf being quite intelligent, managed to convince the young man of his word's truth, and at the same time, dissuaded him from the idea of staying in the forests overnight in an attempt to encounter the animal. The forest expanses of Alaska were the beast's territory. Land it knew far better than people accustomed to moving only along narrow paths. Here, one had to act differently. Some cunning was needed to even the odds. Jake didn't know what could be done, but Mr. Lawrence Thomas had an idea. Every beast can smell blood, reasoned the old man, pulling a sharp blade from its sheath. Removing a glove from his hand, he drew the blade across his palm, leaving a small cut from which blood immediately began to ooze. Lawrence clenched his hand into a fist and slightly turned it aside. Crimson drops fell onto the frozen grass. For a moment, Jake thought he could smell the blood. Don't just stand there, let's go. A couple of drops in one place won't do much good. We need to keep moving. Driven by the elderly man, Jake moved along the trail towards the hills, deciding that returning to the town, leaving behind a trail of bloody tracks, would be too dangerous. What if Mr. Thomas was right, and the animal, sensing the blood, would make its presence known? Perhaps the beast had been starving for several days, or even lay dying, wounded by Jake's father. The latter was a hopeful thought, but intuition stubbornly suggested that the creature was still somewhere close, waiting for the right moment to attack. The wound on Lawrence's palm had long since stopped bleeding. Along with Jake, the man hid among the trees, rapidly losing their remaining leaves. The wind that penetrated the clothes chilled the skin and made it difficult to concentrate, and the night that soon fell confused them even more. The beast did not show up, although Lawrence and Jake returned later than everyone else. Just as they crossed the threshold of the pub, a menacing wolf howl swept over the town, but the beast did not come into the settlement itself. Only the next morning, returning to the hills, did Jake notice animal tracks on the path where Mr. Thomas had cut his hand? Why the wolf chose not to attack them remained unclear, as was whether the animal had been watching the hunters or arrived there later. Several subsequent days again brought no results. Jake began to consider that Mr. Thomas might be right. The wolf was indeed very, very intelligent. It attacked suddenly, steered clear of traps, and knew when it was best to retreat into the shadows, giving people false hope that the nightmare had ended. Then, after some time, the beast would attack again, catching the hunters off guard. In its next attack, which happened early one Sunday morning, a little girl suffered several quite serious injuries, 
and her mother was killed outright. Fifteen people have died, including several children and the town's best hunters, Mr. Thomas declared in the pub one day. Any day now, the mayor will send someone from his assistance with police officers and hunters. Just what we need, those idiots. They'll just scare off all the animals in the forest and waste bullets for nothing. Those fools wouldn't even recognize their own tracks, laughed one of the hunters, Ben. Jake knew him very little, but over the last few weeks, he had come to understand that this man, like him, also wished to find the beast. However, unlike Jake, driven by a thirst for vengeance, Ben had a different interest. Even dead, this wild wolf represented significant value. Half the state would want to see it. If they charged a dollar per view, one could quickly become rich. Mr. Thomas turned out to be right. It wasn't two days before a squad of 15 men arrived in the town, led by Captain Berger. Arthur Berger was a cumbersome, portly, and rather unpleasant man. His perpetually dissatisfied glare and the harsh voice with which he issued orders left and right were enough to establish his character. After learning all the details he was interested in about the wolf, he and his squad spent an entire week in the town, during which they killed several dozen animals encountered in the forests around the settlement. Each evening, returning from the hunt, Captain Berger would display the dead wolves with a satisfied smile, highlighting the largest among them, and confidently claiming that the beast was finally slain. But he would grind his teeth in displeasure whenever Jake or any other hunter stated that none of the killed wolves were even close to the beast in question. The captain's patience seemed to be running thin. How long have we been here? A week? And how many attacks have there been during this time? None, the captain pondered. He slowly paced along the pub's tables, casting a particularly displeased look at Jake. The young man evoked a special antipathy in him, simply because he was too young for serious matters like hunting. And yet he dared to contradict Berger's orders. The beast is long dead. Otherwise it would have made itself known by now. Just admit it. You know nothing about hunting and are just scared, Ben mockingly remarked. If you want to, go back to your mayor and tell him we'll catch the beast ourselves. Captain Berger turned purple with rage but found no words for a comeback. He bolted from the pub, and to the townspeople's surprise, he got into his car and drove towards the forest, ignoring warnings and advice. What are you doing? Ben called out to Jake. Noticing where the captain had headed, Jake decided to follow him, either to dissuade him from such a risky venture or simply to observe the attempts of the cumbersome man to subdue the beast. We can't just leave him there alone. He may not be the brightest, but we know better what the beast is capable of. We can't let it kill someone else, even a police captain like him. Jake shrugged. Together, they set off after Arthur. By the time Jake and Ben reached deep into the forest and found the wrecked police officer's car, night had already enveloped everything in its dark covers. Suddenly, a scream was heard. Hurry! Ben shouted and ran towards the source of the desperate cries of the captain. By the time they found the man, the beast, having sunk its fangs into Arthur's neck, was completing its deadly ritual. Realizing there was no saving the captain, Ben and Jake, without a second thought, turned around and headed back to the town. Perhaps they hoped the captain's body would at least temporarily delay the wolf, which, judging by its emaciated appearance, hadn't eaten in a long time. But the beast, growling, gave chase to the hunters. Running was futile. The monster moved much faster than humans. Its paw strikes on the ground resembled thunderclaps in the vast sky. One leap, two, three, and Ben screamed as he fell, hitting the cold earth hard. Turning around, Jake only managed to see the wolf leap towards him. In the next moment, he too fell onto a fallen tree, hitting his head and temporarily losing consciousness. 
The crackling of branches, some incomprehensible rustling and disturbance nearby quickly subsided as soon as Jake opened his eyes and stared at the black sky, generously sprinkled with sparkling stars at night. Neither the beast nor Ben was anywhere to be seen. His head throbbed intolerably and a large bump had formed on the back of his head, making it difficult for Jake to immediately get to his feet. In the darkness, nothing could be seen beyond his own nose. Of course, it was foolish to shout his companion's name at the top of his lungs, but Jake couldn't simply run away, leaving Ben in the clutches of the beast. However much the young man called out for the hunter, he did not respond. Leaning on the trunks of trees, the young man despondently headed back to the town, constantly looking back. Several times he thought he heard the wolf sneaking up on him from behind, ready to attack, but each time, drawing his flashlight, he immediately lowered it, realizing that the wolf was not nearby. Why the beast hadn't killed him remained a mystery to Jake, one that he pondered all the way. Only by morning did he reach the town, the inhabitants of which were still asleep, unaware that the monster had gone hunting again. Jake's first stop was Priest Richard, who woke the townspeople. Very quickly, many gathered in front of the church, listening with horror and indignation to Jake's story. The young hunter was barely standing from fatigue, but he rejected his mother's timid requests to rest even a little, intending to lead the hunters to the very place where the beast had attacked them. Some residents agreed to help and followed the boy, keeping their weapons ready. As expected, the captain was dead. The wolf had literally ripped open his throat and then left him untouched, presumably chasing after Jake and Ben. There was no trace of Ben, although after 10 minutes of thorough searching, one of the hunters noticed broken branches and scrapes on the ground a few dozen yards from the scene. Upon closer inspection, Jake realized that the wolf might have dragged Ben along and he tried to grasp anything, clawing the earth with his fingers. And another attempt to find any clue quickly failed. Maybe Ben is still alive, one of the townspeople speculated thoughtfully, noticing how restlessly Jake paced around the found tracks. But for how long? His question hung in the air, making the young man tense. Indeed, how long would the wolf keep Ben alive? And why hadn't it killed the hunter outright? The hours long attempts to find Ben were unsuccessful. Even as the sun generously spread its rays across the vast forests, giving the town and its surroundings a rather peaceful appearance. It was hard to imagine that a monstrous, invincible, and elusive creature filled with malice, hatred, and a desire to kill dwelled here. The hunters were disheartened. By noon, everyone had returned to the town, and soon loud banging and scraping could be heard from all directions. Residents tried to reinforce the windows and doors of their homes, hoping to protect themselves this way. The talk of continuing the search was no longer on the table. People were too exhausted and frightened. The captain's body was sent to his family and several assistants accompanied it, using this as a pretext to be as far away from the town and the beast as possible. How long have you been asleep? Mr. Smith asked Jake caringly, noticing how the young man wearily rubbed his eyes. In the pub, a couple of people were already considerably drunk despite the early hour, quietly discussing plans about where to flee from the town to save their skins. Pathetic cowards, Jake thought. I'm on my way, the young man responded, rising from the table. Fatigue permeated his body, but the thought that Ben might still be alive gave him strength. After saying goodbye to Mr. Smith, Jake headed towards home, but upon reaching the right street, he sharply turned the corner, glancing over his shoulder. Meister Smith, fortunately, did not follow him from the pub. Checking that his flashlight was in place, Jake ran to one of the paths leading to the fields. Let everyone else cowardly sit in their homes, 
bolting doors and windows shut. But Jake would catch this damned wolf, whatever the cost. With these thoughts, young Hunter made his way through the overgrown bushes into the heart of the forest, unafraid of the suddenly silent birds or suspicious rustles sounding from all around. Even if an entire pack of such wolves jumped out at him from behind the trees, the young man would not give in. Branches cracked loudly underfoot. If the beast were anywhere nearby, it would surely hear the intrusion of the uninvited guest. Jake felt increasingly heavy as he walked, the flashlight weighing down his hand and his heart pounding wildly in his chest. Repeating the names of all the deceased like a prayer, the young man forced himself forward, already ceasing to understand what he was hoping for by embarking on such a journey alone and unprepared. The desire to kill the beast had clouded all reasonable arguments about abandoning the venture and returning. That Ben was probably long dead, and that the wolf might be entirely elsewhere. But something prevented Jake from accepting the frightening truth, and he continued on. A sudden and too loud cawing made the boy stop and freeze in place. Somewhere very close again, a rustle was heard, as if someone very cautiously stepped on the treacherously rustling leaves on the cold ground. The sky overhead had already been covered with a dense veil of gray clouds. And looking up, Jake noticed how slowly snowflakes began to waltz in the air. And then, between the trees ahead, the young man saw some sort of clearing. Reaching it, Jake emerged onto a small glade, on the left side of which several stone boulders protruded from the ground, forming an entrance to a cave that went deep into the earth. The lair of the beast. The wolf itself was nowhere to be seen. The animal was hiding, not deeming it necessary to come out, at least not now. The beast seemed to be waiting for the right moment and Jake, pulling out his flashlight, was ready to confront the enemy at any second. He began to slowly approach the lair, constantly looking around and listening. A grave silence prevailed. Even time seemed to have frozen in this place. Ben? Jake called out softly. After waiting a few minutes and hearing no response, the young man dared to call his friend a little louder. Then again and again, until he approached the lair. Holding the flashlight ready, Jake realized the beast might have heard his voice, and escaping this place alive would be nothing short of a miracle. Yet Jake was not inclined to retreat. Taking a deep breath, he stepped deeper into the cave, extending the flashlight in front of him. The ringing silence embraced him in its velvet arms, and darkness surrounded him from all sides, forcing the young man to pause momentarily to allow his eyes to adjust to the darkness. Besides his ragged breathing, the boy soon heard some other rustling. It was entirely possible that it was the wolf rising from the depths of its dwelling, and Jake tensed up, ready to use his flashlight as a weapon if needed. However, as he ventured further, the rustling became clearer and then it was accompanied by a soft moan and a weak voice uttered, Who's there? Ben. Jake immediately responded, quickening his pace. Almost tripping over a stone, he entered a small earthen room. Its walls were clawed and at its center a feeble fire blazed, which the man apparently had made using a couple of stones and his torn jacket. As the flame grew, human bones scattered here and there, some broken belongings, and occasionally, even weapons came into view. The stench in the lair was unbearable. Can you walk? Jake asked, offering his hand to his companion. With difficulty, but Ben managed to get up, then, swaying and groaning, grabbed the earthen wall with his hand. In the light of the dying fire, Jake saw that Ben's left leg was covered in blood. Lean on me, I'll get us out, the young man said, supporting the man by the waist. Ben was much heavier than Jake had imagined, making it impossible for them to move quickly. Moreover, navigating in the darkness was even more challenging, 
and it felt like they walked for at least an hour to exit the cave. But by the time they finally emerged into the fresh air, it hadn't even begun to darken. Ben leaned tiredly against a cold boulder while Jake looked around, breathing heavily. The way back to town was not short. It would be a miracle if they managed to reach it by night without encountering the beast. Who knows where the monster was lurking now? Could it have killed someone else and dragged them to its cave as it did with Ben? How many bones were in its lair? What Jake saw flashed before his eyes for a moment. Too many killed, and all of them were clearly not from their town. Why had no one reported this bloodthirsty monster before? How long had the beast been killing innocents without any punishment? There's something there, Ben whispered, pointing with a trembling hand to the opposite side of the clearing. Handing him his flashlight, Jake once again grabbed his rifle, taking a few confident steps in the direction his friend had indicated. Every cell in his body froze in excruciating anticipation. The young man even held his breath, already aiming. Ben behind him also stiffened, straightening up and stepping away from the boulder. Despite his injury, he was also ready to fight. The wolf emerged exactly from where they expected. It did not need tricks to approach its prey unnoticed. Instead, it leaped from behind the trees, soaring through the air like an arrow shot from a bow, and Jake's first shot was fired too low. The bullet whistled through the air, and the beast, landing on all fours, crouched to the ground, baring its sharp teeth, preparing for another leap. Shouting for Ben to run, Jake charged forward, firing another shot. The beast astonishingly managed to dodge to the side, avoiding injury, and then, with a powerful push from its paws off the ground, it landed right in front of Jake in a single leap. Fresh blood dripped from its shaggy snout. Its blood-filled eyes locked onto the young man's. The animal towered proudly over the hunter, and Jake could clearly see the beast's muscles tense. He prepared to deliver the final blow, and the young man, more out of instinct, thrust the rifle butt forward, striking the wolf on its massive snout. The beast jerked to the side, emitting a menacing growl while the hunter retreated back, feeling more confident. He swung again, but the wolf swatted him to the ground with its paw. At that moment, a blade plunged into the beast's shoulder. Ben had thrown it with his last ounce of strength, collapsing to the ground alongside Jake. The wolf howled, jerking towards Ben, but Jake struck it again with the rifle butt, forcing the animal to turn its attention back to the hunter. Barely dodging the following swipe of its paw, the young man struck the wolf with his rifle once more, this time driving the blade deeper into the animal's shoulder up to the hilt. The beast howled even louder, rising on its hind legs, but instead of unleashing its fury on Jake, it darted away, disappearing into the forest, leaving a trail of blood on the ground. From the sky, now obscured by gray clouds, the first snow began to fall. Fluffy flakes slowly settled on the withered leaves and the two hunters, who spent several minutes trying to catch their breath. To face the beast alone and survive was truly unimaginable, and Ben was doubly lucky. Hoping that the monster would not return was futile. Only after standing up did Jake feel a sharp pain in his side. Beneath the layer of torn clothing was a serious wound inflicted by the wolf's sharp claws. Supporting each other, the young man and Ben headed back to town, and the closer they got to their home, the more clearly they saw black, pitch-like smoke rising into the sky, which clearly boded no good. As they were just a few dozen yards away from the town, the hunters started hearing some screams. Expending their last bit of energy to quicken their pace, Jake and Ben arrived at what once was their town. More accurately, what remained of it. The beast was here, Mr. Smith yelled. His face was covered in soot, his hands trembled, and his clothes were torn in several places. Several houses behind him were ablaze with hellish flames, 
and people unsuccessfully tried to douse them. Desperate cries were heard from all directions. Some ran, some sought help, and all were terrified to death. As it turned out, the wolf had come to the town almost immediately after Jake had left. The beast had gone mad, attacking everyone it encountered, wreaking havoc, driving everyone into panic, and disappearing as suddenly as it had appeared. In an attempt to rid themselves of the monster, everything was used, rifles, axes, clubs, and even fire. 30 killed already, Mr. Smith said in a voice hoarse with emotion. The mayor probably doesn't know yet, but by tomorrow he'll surely send someone else. But who can save us from this monster? Their encounter with the wolf and return to the half-destroyed town by fire were the talk of the town for the third day, considered to be under some divine protection. Whoever was watching over Jake and Ben, they were sure that if the wolf truly wanted them dead, it would have certainly killed them, even with a blade in its shoulder. Upon learning of the police captain's death and that the wolf was becoming more ferocious with each attack, the mayor offered a substantial reward for its capture. Perhaps it was because of this reward that suddenly dozens of volunteers appeared. Each believed their bullet would kill the monster. Jake just shook his head, watching such fools who truly did not understand what awaited them upon encountering the beast. The outcome of any forthcoming battle had been predetermined long ago. No one was capable of defeating this wolf. Due to his injury, Jake was not in a condition to join the hunt for the beast along with everyone else, much like Ben, who was completely unable to walk. Engulfed in his gloomy thoughts, Jake headed to the pub, even though the doctor had explicitly forbidden him to leave his bed. The wound throbbed with each step, but this pain allowed the young man to remember every second spent dangerously close to the beast. It helped him clearly envision the hateful gleam in those dark, night-like eyes, feel the deadly menace emanating from the animal with every cell of his body, and remember that this wolf had killed his beloved, his friends, and his father. Men's voices mixed with the sound of hammers. The squeak and screech of a saw could be heard from the street until late at night. While some were out hunting, those who remained took on the task of repairing and rebuilding homes damaged in the fire. When darkness fell, everyone rushed to the pub, and Jake could overhear snippets of conversations and phrases, all related to the wolf, the mayor's reward, and today's ambush. It was uncertain when the hunters would return, so no one was in a hurry to go to sleep, hoping that at any moment the pub doors would swing open and the hunters would enter dragging the dead beast with them. But time passed, and the hunters did not return. Struggling to get home, Jake made his bed next to the window, leaving it open for the night, so he could hear the hunters return and immediately go out to meet them. He felt uneasy about being unable to contribute at the moment. After all, it was Jake who had found the beast's lair, faced the wolf, and managed to escape death more than once. He was convinced that if anyone was to catch the monster, it should be him. The next day brought no news from the group that had gone into the forest. The town's inhabitants tried to go about their usual tasks, yet a unique tension hung in the air. By evening, some started to say that waiting for the hunters was pointless. The wolf, yet again, had proven to be smarter, killing every single one of them. Nobody wanted to believe such rumors, though Jake occasionally noticed people shuddering, lowering their fearful eyes to the ground, pretending as if they weren't concerned by what was happening. No one returned even by nightfall. Ben, leaning on a cane, managed to make his way to the bar, sitting opposite Jake, and asked in all seriousness if they should gather some group and head to the lair. Maybe they are indeed dead, and we are waiting not for salvation, but death, Ben declared. Despite his injury, the man was ready to go into the forest himself, and Jake increasingly understood why this person, among all others, 
evoked his sympathy. Perhaps Ben simply reminded Jake of himself, equally stubborn, risk-taking, and desperate. He had seen what the wolf was capable of, nearly died, but wasn't afraid of confronting the monster again. Before the boy could respond, the pub doors burst open with a bang, slamming against the wall, and a panting young man rushed in. Waving some sheet of paper, he tried to catch his breath, struggling to articulate something utterly incoherent. As all patrons curiously stared at the stranger, he swallowed hard, coughed, and raising the sheet above his head announced, Important message from the governor. He began reading some very intriguing information, and Jake and Ben eagerly hung on his every word. It turned out that after the announcement about the dreadful beast in the town and the reward for the monster's head was made public, people from neighboring towns and regions started contacting the governor with messages that they too had once seen the beast. It turned out that this wolf didn't stick to one place and had been hunting humans for quite some time. It was not yet possible to determine exactly when the first attacks occurred, but two years ago, there were several gruesome murders to the south of the town, and a couple of months before that, two girls living to the east claimed they saw a gigantic wolf in the forest. Last year, the beast hunted not far from Jake's town, but the number of victims didn't exceed seven people, so no one thought to inform the mayor or governor about the attacks. So, the wolf circled around before getting to us? Mr. Smith asked, spreading a large map on the table when the stranger finished speaking. That's the wrong question. One of the men shook his head. What's more important is why it didn't stay in other places for more than a couple of weeks, but has been visiting us for over a month? And the number of victims here is much higher than in other places. What does it find so displeasing about our town? People crowded around the map began to speculate and question, trying to understand the situation, while Jake approached Tom, the guy who brought information from the governor. Can you find out more about all these killings? Dig up anything else? Maybe something like this happened here before? Maybe the beast has been in these parts before? Tom shrugged, frowning slightly and said he would try to find anything that could be related to the attacks, the beast, and this town. He wasn't entirely sure how this could help kill the monster. Ben bombarded the friend with questions as soon as Tom stepped out of the pub, and until closing time, he and Jake discussed everything they heard that evening. The next morning, the hunters finally returned. Or rather, only part of them. It turned out, the wolf was prepared for the arrival of uninvited guests. The celebrated hunters didn't even manage to wound the beast, let alone lure it into their clever traps. Frustrated by their own failure, they remained in sullen silence until the next day. After some time, Tom returned, worn out, pale, and with tousled hair, but with several sheets of paper filled with small handwriting. There were details not only about the attacks that occurred in the last couple of years, but also about a massacre near this town, a bloody carnage that happened about 10 years ago. There was a newspaper clipping, but somehow no one could find it. Tom shrugged, trying to recall as many details as possible. It's a very convoluted story. Apparently a dead child was found in a field and a large wolf resembling the one that's been roaming here, was seen nearby. Well, the local people, not being fools, grabbed their rifles and knives and organized something unimaginable. They caught six or seven wolves right in that den in the forest. And they killed them all one by one. One by one, Jake repeated. They executed them. The child was killed and all that. They say it took them chasing the wolves around the field with knives and rifles for more than an hour before all the wolves died. Tom shivered. It was a ghastly sight, as I was told. Blood everywhere. And then it turned out, purely by accident, that it wasn't the beast that killed the child, but his own father, can you imagine? Horrible. 
the man had something wrong with his head, and the child's crying drove him over the edge. He intended to take his son into the forest and leave him there as punishment, but the child started to act up even more along the way, trying to break free. Then he hit him, and after that, as if entering a frenzy. Had his wife been alive, things might have turned out differently, but as it was. This story shocked Jake. An adult killing his own son, and then people torturing wolves. Nobody could forbid people from hunting animals. After all, everyone wanted meat. But there's a difference between killing and torturing. But that's not all, Tom continued, unaware that Jake had become deeply engrossed in his thoughts. After the father confessed to everything, more details emerged. He was startled by the wolf when he was, well, you know, frightened by the beast, the man ran home, thinking the animal would surely finish off the boy. But the child was already dead, and the wolf wasn't planning to kill the child. On the contrary, the beast managed to snag the man, as if trying to scare him off, to save the boy. But these are just speculations, of course. Would a predator do such a thing? To save a human? Hard to believe, somehow. But the fact remains. That man had huge cuts on his arm afterward, and then he left the town. Never seen again since. Thanking Tom for such an informative story, Jake and Ben stepped out of the pub into the fresh air, then silently made their way to the churchyard. The story they heard seemed implausible, a fabrication, but at the same time it could explain a lot. Maybe this beast roaming around the vicinity now seeks vengeance for what was done to its family years ago. Madness. But could it be otherwise? Jake was convinced of the wolf's intelligence. Could the young man's assumption be correct? Is it indeed revenge? And will the animal surely not stop until it has killed everyone in this town? So, it's been hunting people for ten years, Ben muttered in astonishment. Of course, what we've learned is useful information, but what does it give us? No, I'm serious. How do we defeat this predator? I don't think our apologies will suffice. Ben gave a nervous chuckle, staring down at his feet. Jake, meanwhile, feverishly replayed Tom's story over and over in his mind, as if searching for some clue, some answer. But it was futile. It was clear the beast was seeking revenge, and it would continue to do so until the very end. No matter how many volunteers gathered to hunt the wolf, no matter how many hunters the mayor or governor sent, no matter how much money they offered for the monster's head, it was all in vain. The wolf seemed to mock the townspeople, very skillfully avoiding traps and ambushes, continuing to terrorize, attack, and kill. The atmosphere grew tense. People became more withdrawn, aggressive. Almost everyone was out for themselves, as attempts to unite led nowhere. The beast brought chaos of immense magnitude, and it was impossible to shake the feeling of hopelessness that followed. The air was also heavy with the presence of death itself, lingering near the old cemetery where new graves appeared every day. Jake felt much better and planned to join the next hunt along with everyone else. Ben, still limping, wished him luck, promising to keep an eye on the town. Of course, if the wolf decided to attack again, there wouldn't be much use from the man, but perhaps luck would save him once more. As the first rays of the sun pierced through the trees, Jake, heading into the forest, was surprised to find that the hunters weren't really trying to track the beast. They acted randomly, listening intently, peering through the gaps between the trees, and firing at every suspicious rustle. The absence of bird songs, the scarcity of wildlife, it seemed as if the forest was slowly dying, losing its vibrance, all due to people killing every living thing in their path. Unsurprisingly, the hunt, filled with constant gunfire, loud stomping and swearing, seemed futile. A couple of dead wolves, 
a rabbit accidentally shot and frightened birds. That was the entire result. Jake returned to the town enraged, unable to comprehend how life and death could be treated so flippantly. Everyone is scared, desperate, nobody knows what to do, Ben tried to explain. This beast can't be taken down with bullets, and it also evades traps. Almost every day someone dies, hunger has started in the town because everyone is afraid to leave their homes. Even the mayor can't do anything. Some have even packed their things and left, hoping to find refuge elsewhere. Forgot what Tom told us? Jake asked wearily. The beast won't just leave us alone. Ben didn't argue. He too believed that the beast was much smarter than the mayor and his people thought. To them, it was just an animal that needed to be killed and its evasion of traps was merely coincidence. Calling them naive fools to himself, Jake decided that from now on, he would search for the beast separately from the rest. At least he often had luck encountering the wolf one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe without the others getting in the way, he could find the beast faster. However, even before Jake, accompanied by the limping Ben, set out for the forest, it became known that one of the hunters had managed to seriously injure the beast. But after tracking it by the bloody trail to its lair, the men somehow lost the animal again. The cave was empty, and that's where the tracks ended. Pleased that they at least managed to wound the wolf, the hunters returned to the town, deciding that the animal wouldn't get far from them now. Despite the darkness, Jake still decided to risk going to the lair, followed by Ben. Though Ben was more of a hindrance that didn't allow for quick movement, Jake was glad that his friend had come with him. Even if there was no beast, wandering through the forest at night was eerie, and the prevailing silence made the atmosphere even more sinister. The only thing that helped them not to get lost and not succumb to fear were the glowing lanterns in their hands. I don't think he'll return to the lair, Ben noted when they were about ten minutes away from the cave. Jake fully agreed with him. Something inside strongly suggested that they should be searching for the wolf somewhere else entirely. But it was still worth checking the lair, at least to see the bloody tracks and where they ended. Maybe they'd be luckier than the other hunters. As with everything else, they saw nothing of value. The beast had returned to its home, but then, without even entering, simply vanished into thin air. Jake speculated that the wolf could have leaped over the boulders and disappeared into the forest. It would only need a couple of jumps to do so. And as Jake thought, Ben found a few drops of blood on one of the boulders. He just snorted, muttering something obscene under his breath about the luckless men from the town, and headed in the direction the beast had gone. The winding, narrow path, partially covered with snow, made several sharp turns, climbing over the hills encountered along the way, and then sharply descending to pits and ravines, through which Ben struggled noticeably. He even had to find a sturdier stick to lean on, but when Jake suggested they return to the town, Ben just gave him a sullen look and continued on. The veil of clouds made even the moon invisible. The light from their lanterns was sufficient to illuminate the path underfoot, but seeing anything beyond a couple of yards was impossible. Thus, both Jake and Ben were surprised to find themselves back at the clearing where the townspeople had been killed years ago. Neither was sure they had followed the wolf's tracks here. They were more trying to stick to the path, which surely had to lead somewhere. Perhaps the wolf had veered off it long ago, and they had come to a completely different place. Yet Jake felt that this was precisely the place they needed to be. Here, ten years ago, the event that might have started this whole saga occurred. Here, a pack of wolves was exterminated, among which possibly was the very beast that now tormented the townspeople. Maybe here, where it all began, was also where it all should end. Look, who's that over there? Ben asked, 
prompting Jake to raise his torch higher. In the middle of the field, there was a person in a dark cloak with a lantern in hand, swaying and trembling as if caught in winter's chill or experiencing deep fear. He was making some gurgling noises, occasionally sobbing, and sometimes began to howl mournfully. Only when the person stopped and pulled the hood from his head did Jake and Ben recognize him as the local priest. The fire's light cast bizarre shadows on his swollen, tear-streaked face. What's he doing here? Jake frowned, stepping forward. The priest, having lost control of himself lately, was the last person they expected to risk the night in the forest, well aware that a fierce beast roamed somewhere nearby. Meanwhile, the priest, ceasing to sway, proudly lifted his head and stared at the trees as if expecting someone to come out to him. He even said something, not too loudly, so Jake and Ben couldn't make out a word, but they tensed up when they saw someone indeed emerge from the forest. But it was not a person, as one might expect, but the wolf. Slowly, limping on one paw, it approached the priest and stopped a few yards from him. We have to, Ben began, but Jake stopped him. Wait, just listen, Jake whispered, watching the priest, who suddenly began to speak. It was all my fault, the priest said in a cracking voice, and astonishingly, the wolf seemed to listen to every word. The beast had never delayed its attacks before, usually catching its victims off guard. But now, everything was somehow different. Go get help, Jake quietly told Ben. Come on, the hunters need to make it while the beast is still here. We can't handle it on our own anyway. Ben didn't argue. He turned around and almost ran back to the town. Meanwhile, Jake watched the wolf and the priest intently, trying to piece together all the fragments in his mind. Could it be that the man who killed his own child and then blamed the wolves was the priest? Yet it was the priest who now stood before the beast, looking into its eyes, shaking with sobs, and apologizing for something. At one point, the priest suddenly fell to his knees, covering his face with his hands, and at that very moment, the wolf lunged forward with a roar, sinking its teeth into the man's shoulder. By the time Jake reached the priest, the latter had stopped screaming, having collapsed face down in the snow, which slowly turned red beneath his body, while the beast, blood dripping from its muzzle, backed away, still limping. It didn't seem aggressive. Rather, it appeared exhausted. Aiming his rifle at the wolf, Jake suddenly realized that this wolf was very old. It had spent its entire life seeking revenge, and now, it seemed, had concluded its mission. How else could you explain the wolf's lack of attempt to attack Jake, to save its own skin, to flee? There was no gleam in its eyes, only fatigue and even a hint of resignation to what might come next. Jake's hand trembled. Here was the beast that had killed his father, his friends, and many others. He only had to pull the trigger, to put a bullet between its black eyes and end it all. But suddenly, it became clear to Jake that everything had already ended, here and now, and there was no need to waste a bullet. The wolf didn't have long to live anyway. Lowering his rifle, not yet understanding why, he nodded towards the forest. Leave, Jake said firmly. He could swear the wolf understood him perfectly and even seemed to nod its massive, shaggy head slightly. It slowly turned around and walked away, barely moving its paws. The beast no longer posed a threat as it had before. There was no fear in watching the visibly emaciated animal, its fur in places stained with dried blood. As soon as it disappeared behind the trees, Excited voices and footsteps were heard behind Jake. Armed with rifles, hunters led by Ben rushed to help and were quite disappointed to see the beast had left. Noticing the priest's body, most were shocked, muttering something about only true devils being capable of killing a servant of the church. 
Jake recounted everything that had happened later at the pub. He didn't specify that he had let the wolf go. He said he didn't manage to stop it in time and added that the beast surely wouldn't return. Of course, no one wanted to believe that. The idea that the beast would just calmly leave was clearly never to be believed. But when Jake recounted the story from 10 years ago, reminding many townsfolk of the bloody massacre, and added that the priest seemed to be the man who had killed his son and caused the brutal killing of the wolf pack, many began to doubt. I just can't understand one thing, Jake mused, addressing the local elder sitting next to him. Ben eagerly hung on every word. Did nobody recognize the priest when he returned to the town? Did everyone so easily forget about the child murderer? People try to forget such terrible things as the killing of a child as soon as possible, to avoid bringing disaster upon themselves. The elder shrugged. Besides, the priest arrived in town about a year and a half ago. He had changed a lot over those years, even took a different name. We knew him as a different person before. He grew a beard, lost a lot of weight. Even now, knowing who he really is, I would still doubt it. Not only the elder was unsure that the priest suddenly turned out to be a long-forgotten person, a cowardly liar who had left the town many years ago, but the scars on his hands, left by the wolf back then, which he carefully hid under his clothes, still indicated that Jake's story was true. And the ancient story, at last, came to an end. The wolf no longer made its presence known. For a long time, many volunteers went into the forest hoping to find at least the body of the beast, to show it to the people and the mayor, and to receive the promised reward for it. But their searches were not successful. The wolf lost itself among the vast forests of Alaska and never showed itself again, although legends of the beast would stir hearsay, sounding in various versions and places for a long time. And only one person knows how it all truly happened. 